Hi and welcome to my home. I'm your host Christopher Cheryl Lambus and we're doing a special talk today about me, my life, um, how I got involved in Jiu Jitsu, how I transformed from the type of lifestyle I was living to where I've got to today. Um, it's just a personal talk, maybe this will help people change some of the ways that they have already sunk into them from a young child and growing up as a teenager. Maybe people have similar experiences that can actually connect to what I'm talking about. And I think it's important that people understand that it's not easy to change all the bad habits that we all have. And I think generally in, in life we all end up creating bad habits for ourselves from seeing other people do things to um, just finding your own way and basically who you become today. Alright, so where do we start? We start as a child. What type of family upbringing did I have? I was pretty lucky. Um, we weren't. We were a middle class family. We had main, the main things we needed. We had a good home, um, a strong family connection. I had two sisters, and me. I was the youngest. And my family are Greek from Cyprus, from a, a little village called Oslo is where my mom was from, up in the mountains of Cyprus and my dad a bit further closer to the capital um, called... See, my dad was from a village called Lasagna um, again up in the mountains um, and typical Greek families are very very close together cousins and we normally have big families in fact my dad had I think yeah he had seven brothers two sisters my mom's family was a little small it was just her and her sister and so but my dad's side was a huge family lived in a quite a small place actually i don't even know how the whole family lived together because it wasn't too big either so they came my father came from a very small lifestyle not poor but not rich um and it was my granddad that really brought my family to England. So basically what happened was my granddad um, had a home in Cyprus but was offered to come and fight in a war by the British in World War II. So he accepted and he came over to fight. They were paying good money. So he was actually a sailor on a ship. And the ship got stuck by the Germans. And... He was floating in the water, he had his life jacket on and luckily another ship came along and picked him up and he survived and obviously we wouldn't be here today if that moment didn't happen. So for that my, uh, my grandfather moved to England with his wife and they had a cafe, I'm not sure if he owned the cafe or he, he was just working in a cafe, that I'm not too sure about. So he offered my parents, my mother and father, to come to England and work. They came over. And at the time, my uncle was also over here as well, my uncle Cliff. And as they settled in England, eventually, my uncle and my dad and my uncle's brother set up a business in Sheffield. It was a restaurant, actually. They knew a lot about food, so they knew that to their advantage, and they opened the restaurant very famous restaurant back in the 80s, early 80s, in Sheffield called the Old Coach House. Um, that's where they made uh, a great living. It supported three families. And it was a huge place, it had three floors. Downstairs was like a restaurant slash cafe, I suppose. Upstairs was like discotheque uh, with a restaurant as well where they had parties. And the third floor was like offices. It was, it was down on the Wicker in Sheffield, for those that know Sheffield, it was on the Wicker. And they got a good reputation from that. Eventually, in the late 80s, they sold the business. My father 
moved to Chesterfield with us and opened a fish and chip shop actually, a fish and chip shop restaurant, which he was very successful and made a lot of people in Chesterfield happy with the food he was selling. That's where I started to work eventually and the family was quite successful in Chesterfield on Whittington, on Whittington Moor. So actually the business is still there, owned by other people called North Sea Fish Bar. Around about that time, um, growing up, I just go back a little bit and as a child, Greek families would get together with their cousins, they had a lot of cousins, they would come around on a Sunday, they would um, have like little parties at home, eat food, normally like it would be pork, lamb, lots of meat and afterwards they would start to drink alcohol and get drunk. This is, this is tradition I suppose for, to drink alcohol um, around the world, no different anywhere else. Um, so they would do the same things and growing up as a child I would see this and pick up on it and as I got older, especially around about 12, 13 years old, I would want to do these things too to start drinking alcohol and that's what exactly what I did. You're influenced by the people you watch. It doesn't mean it's wrong or it's right, it's just that the fact of the matter is alcohol is a drug. Whether you like it or not, some people don't realize this, but alcohol is a drug. It changes the mind how we act, along with smoking. My dad was a smoker who um, had an operation in his mid-40s due to... He had a heart bypass, actually. And then he had a triple bypass later on in life. In life. So he wasn't the healthiest of people. Uh, God bless my father, he's not here anymore. But um, yeah, his health wasn't too great which helped me in my journey actually, to be straightforward and honest. But anyway, I was growing up, it got, I got to my teens, I remember my father smoking, but he quit, he did a good job in quitting, but anyway, I, I hung around with maybe seeing other people smoking, I started to smoke as a 14, 15 year old, I would go out, go start drinking with friends, and this carried on regularly, all the way through to about 20, one years old, I think, 21, 22, no, 24, and I decided to quit smoking, which wasn't easy, I quit, and then two years later on, I went on holiday with my friends to Cyprus, and they were smoking, and I started to smoke again. This brings us to where I started Jiu-Jitsu. At the time, around about 20. 29 I was happy with my life I was a little overweight actually I'm quite a bit overweight I was about 13 14 stone which is quite heavy for me and I was having a bit of a belly and my sister turned around to me one day and said listen Chris you're overweight do something about it you're fat I know the word doesn't sound nice but she was straightforward and I'm the type of person that if someone tells me to do something I generally do it you can I, I can take harsh comments some people are not that way but she, my sister's my sister and she's normally very honest with me and I thought about it and I said okay. I started going to the gym, meals started to change, I would eat lots of protein meals, so I would, I would eat meat every day to try and put protein in my body and I started bodybuilding and I put a lot of muscle on and I became 14 stone eventually of which is about 85 kilograms, I think, of muscle. I really, I really bulked up. And I moved to Madlock at the time. And I wanted to learn Jiu-Jitsu. I'd seen Hoist Gracie fighting in the UFC. My cousin introduced me to that in the... I think it was about... When I was about 22, 23. So it'd be about the year 2000. Maybe a little bit after, but somewhere around about that, I saw Hoist Gracie doing his thing, as many of you probably did, and wanted to do the same thing. So it came to 2008, 9, I think it was 2009. I found a guy called Tim 
in Matlock, who was teaching at a small place, I think it was called uh, Jester's, yeah, in, in Matlock, and he had a class on a Monday and a Friday, and I could only go on a Monday, because I was working the rest of the time, so Monday I would go there and train, and I quickly really started to like Jiu Jitsu, but as time went on, I felt like what I was learning didn't look the same as what I was seeing Hoist Gracie do. I couldn't put the the images together. What I was learning it didn't look quite didn't make sense to me. So I started to do some searching online. I knew America where a lot of the Gracies were. In fact, I even spoke to Hoist at a seminar. The first seminar I went to, I asked him a question of where to go and. You know, I asked about the Valente brothers in Miami and he said, yeah, they have a good school. They, um, there's hotels around, you can find a place to stay. So I emailed Valente brothers. I contacted Hickson as well. I also contacted Gracie Academy. Hickson, I never got an email back. I don't know why. Uh, nothing came back from that. Um, Valente brothers contacted me back very politely told me what I needed to know, and so did Gracie Academy. So I was in between Gracie Academy and Valente Brothers in Miami. So I had time to think, I thought about it, I thought about it, and something just kept on drawing me to Miami. I don't know what it was, but something was drawing me there. I booked my ticket. I booked my ticket for 2010, April 26. I think 27, 26, one of those two dates. I landed in Miami that day on a Sunday, took my first class on the Monday, and I remember the first week at Valente Brothers, it was very different for me because I would train the morning for an hour, I think it was Monday morning, you have a class in the morning, fundamentals back then they would call it, now it's fighting foundations. And you would learn some self-defense techniques, some standing, some on the ground, and then you would leave. I went to the beach or whatever I did, came back for the nighttime classes, and there was a throwing class at night at the time, and then fighting foundations or fundamentals, sorry, back then, uh, afterwards. And then it's on to next day's classes. And there was no sparring, because back in England, what I would do, or how they taught over here was, and most schools around the world, You'd learn a few techniques and then you spar at the end. And that's what I was expecting, to tell you the truth, just in more detail. So the first week, I was a little confused and I kind of didn't like what I was, what, what I was doing. And I couldn't get into it. But the second week, something changed. I don't know if it was uh, Pedro Valente speech. He said something that clicked in my mind. I can't remember. But something happened where it all made sense and all the pictures... All the images in my brain just all came together. I could see everything that Hoist was doing, what we was learning, and like a little light bulb in my brain went ting, and that was it. I was hooked. Um, so after a month of training in Miami, I stayed there a month. It was expensive. Um, I never thought I was going to be going back to Miami, but as soon as I left, I didn't want to leave, by the way. I knew what I was doing the next year. I would save up and go back to Miami the next year. And I came back to England. I remember that day I got back to England with a hoist seminar on. That literally, as I got back, was going on. So I got in the car and drove straight to the seminar with no sleep and trained again with hoist. And all I had in my mind now was to get back to Miami. So I started saving. I remember my sister saying, you're not going to go anywhere else? I goes, no. She goes, isn't that a little boring? I goes, well, I enjoyed it that much. I want to go back to Miami and, and train. She didn't really get what I was trying to do. Uh, most people like to go different places all the time, but I saw something I really liked. Miami's a nice place and the Jiu Jitsu was fantastic. So I saved up and I went again the next year for another month. And it just got more and more addictive. I loved it, but I wanted to spend more time on jujitsu. And I could only train one day a week in England. It was difficult for me. It was frustrating. 
So when I got back the second time, I spoke to my nephew, Nicholas Haralampos, who at the time had a lot of spare time. And I said to him, listen, you want to learn Jiu Jitsu? Um, I need to practice my self-defense because I had no one to practice over here with. The school that I was going to hardly practice the self-defense stuff and was mainly um, throwing and just on the ground techniques. So I needed to practice the stuff I was learning in Miami. So I bought the book before I came back, the Gracie, um, the Gracie book, Elio Gracie book. I made sure I had that. Nicholas accepted and we started to train together. And quickly his technique started to improve. He was a very technical, very small guy, very technical person. One of the most technical people I've trained with, to tell you the truth. And he, it helped a lot with me teaching him. I made a lot of mistakes with him. My teaching was probably the worst you'd ever seen. But I was trying my best. And the next time I went to Miami, the year after, 2012, I remember taking a private with, with Burak, actually my first private with him or second I can't remember and he said to me why are you doing all this training you're coming to all these classes which is like 81 classes in a month I think it was and you're taking like nine privates and I said to him well I like being on the mat that was my answer to him I remember exactly what I said to him I like being here on the mat because you want to teach and I said, well, I've been on the mat, so it wouldn't make sense. Right now, I'm doing a job that I really don't enjoy that much, to tell you the truth. And that's where it went from there. I, I told him, I think, that I have a nephew that I, I'm working on teaching in England. And I think he mentioned, yeah, continue with that. I can't remember what the conversation was. And then he told me to make sure your privates are with Guy Valente. He will be dealing with you and putting you through a kind of program. I can't remember the exact conversation was, but from there on, I, I was helping out with the kids. So now, instead of just going to my classes, I was going into the kids' classes and helping the teacher teach the kids. But at the time, it was Burak. And Burak was very funny with the kids. The kids used to love him teaching the classes at headquarters. He has his own little character, if I remember correctly, and always got on well with the kids. And that's where I was. I was going into, I would go in the morning, take my classes. In the afternoon, classes would start at 4 o'clock for the kids, or was it half, half past 4, 4.30. And I would be there for the kid classes, uh, juniors 1, juniors 2, sometimes juniors 3. Three kid classes on, on Tuesday and Thursday, you know. And I would help teach the kids, and I learned a lot from that. Through helping the kids, you learn so much. If you can't teach children, who can you teach, in my opinion? The children are the focus. They are the future for all of us. And that was great fun. I, I loved it. And I would come in and out, then I would do my own classes afterwards, and it was exhausting at times. I remember sometimes I'd get home, after class and just hit the bed, I was out like a light. Now, this is where my life started to change a lot. At that, that time, I was, still, I was still drinking. I stopped smoking at 26, and that never came back to me, which I was so happy about. I never, never was interested in it again. To this date, I have no interest in smoking. It's a disgusting habit, in my opinion. Um, so that was out of me. I was already trying to change my diet, but I didn't understand what I was doing because I was doing more bodybuilding stuff, eating a lot of meat. So I remember one time I was out with some friends who went to a place called Mansion Nightclub at the time. It's closed now. Don't know what it is. These days in Miami, and Joaquim and Pedro was there that night. I remember seeing them. They were up in the VIP. And I saw Joaquim and he shook my hand and said hello. And I noticed that they weren't drinking any alcohol. And I've always been a person that when I see something it makes me think. And I started to think and I was like, okay, why are they not drinking alcohol? Yeah, I'm having a great time here. I'm, I'm drunk or whatever I was doing. But they're not drinking. And they seem to be having a good time. What's up? Why are they enjoying themselves just as much as anybody else? 
but they are not drinking. So it got me thinking and I decided right I'm gonna quit drinking. And at the time I was I was dating an American girl and she drank alcohol. So but she she was okay with that. She said, you're gonna drink alcohol again? Because I'm gonna try and stop. So I remember the day I got back to England, it was my friend's wedding, Costa's wedding, a Greek friend of mine, and I got drunk. And then the next morning at the hotel, I woke up and I was like, that is it. June the 10th, I remember the date. I'm not drinking again. And I didn't. That was it. I stopped drinking. And it took me like a year before I could get over the feeling of going out and not having a drink. People would say to me, friends, oh, have a drink, go on, enjoy yourself. It's fun. Are you going to be boring all your life and not drink? And it was depressing. Nothing depressing was harsh. Just it felt weird not to go out and not drink. Uncomfortable feeling. Because I felt at the time that I needed to socialize and I needed to drink alcohol. Social alcoholic, I like, I like to call it. Because when you believe you need something to do something, it's almost an addiction, a social addiction. And many people do this in the world. They need to go out to socialize. They have to drink alcohol. And... Like I said, it took me a year to get over that. But eventually I started going... I, I even stopped going out at one point. I even just stayed at home. And then eventually I started going out again. I got used to the feeling. And before I knew it, it was almost like a load off my, off my body, my head. I didn't need it. So then I was enjoying myself without drinking alcohol. I would just pick a bottle of water and drink it. That was it. And it was, it was like totally different. I was like, wow. All this time I thought I needed to drink alcohol just to socialize, to go out with friends. And that just sent things going off in my mind and opened me to a new world. Um, so I stopped drinking. My diet started to change. The diet was already starting to change actually. I was doing pretty well with that. I started following the Gracie diet, which those... Uh, that know about the Gracie diet, it's about food combinations, that's what it's mainly about, and making the body digest the food much easier. That's his main focus on uh, the Gracie diet. And I was following that, and I was feeling good about myself. The thought of drinking was out of my system, and I was feeling much freer in my mind. And of course, we all have bad habits, and don't expect... By the time you die, at some point in your life, you're going to delete every bad habit. You're probably not. No one's perfect in life. But what we're trying to do is find slow improvements in your life. So, for example, you take two steps forward and maybe one step back. Because you're always going to go backwards here and there. You're always going to make mistakes at some point in your life. So you take a step back, two steps forward again, step back. What you don't want is to have two steps, no, one step forward and two steps back. That way you're never progressing. So yeah, my life started to change a lot from there, opening me up a lot. And like I said, I was teaching my nephew and he was progressing well. He got his blue belt from Hoist Gracie, I think it was 2012. Maybe wrong on that, but I think it was 2012. And he was really helping me a lot. And then we opened, then we moved to our new home in Chesterfield where I had a nice garage next door, and which I used that to build my first dojo um, studio. And I started to teach privates from there. In fact, I used to teach, I used to teach uh, kids' classes there, two group kids' classes, which I've stopped now. Um, and that's how I progressed with my teaching. So my advice to anybody that wants to start teaching is to spend as much time with children coming to the kids' classes, if you're going to Valentine's Road headquarters, or you're with me here, or any other school, is to make sure you're helping kids. Kids is the most important part. Um, and now where am, I? where am I? I started 2010 as a white belt, got my blue belt 2010. Well, actually, 2009 I started Jiu-Jitsu, 2010 I got my blue belt. It took me till 2013, December, to get the purple belt 
um, which to tell you the truth, I don't know why, but from blue to purple feels like an eternity. I remember discussing with, this with friends and they all felt the same way. You feel like you're going to be a blue belt forever. I was only a blue belt for three and a half years, but it felt like ten. <laughs> maybe you're chasing the belt too much. I don't. I don't know what that is. Maybe it's that. But I got the purple belt, and then just focusing on training, and instead of focusing on belts anymore, I wasn't really telling the truth. From purple belt to brown, I no longer cared about the belt no more. I just wanted to learn the techniques and to train to see my friends training in in uh, in America. I have so many good friends that have supported me and helped me train to where I've got to today. Um, I don't need to mention names, they know who they are, who have been with me from the beginning and some of the newer guys too that are training and this in December 2017 I got the rank of brown belt and now I feel like now is really where it starts to begin now uh, you have in your mind that, oh my word, I may have to do the black belt test in the next five years. And it also sets things off in your brain. You've got to start training harder. You've got to start working on the bad habits that you have. You've got to change this. You've got to change that. And it's a lot to look forward to. And so, yeah, that's my life story looks realistically, realistically to today. What I have done and who I've become. I'm not perfect, I know that, but I'm trying to be the best uh, teacher I can be and the best student I can be. It's a lot of hard work and a lot of dedication, a lot of voluntary work. I've done so much voluntary work at the Valente Brothers, helping with the kids, and times where I could be going with friends to the beach or whatever, I'm making sure that I'm in the school doing the kids' classes. I don't have to be there, they've got other people there. I'm making sure I'm putting those hours in doing the voluntary work. That's a part of the benevolence, the kind, helpfulness, usefulness to the people that comes in a part of Jiu Jitsu. And I think it's important because it does help you feel better in yourself and it's also your education. So you are getting something from you, you're getting an education by helping with the children, but nonetheless, because you're learning. You are doing it out of benevolence, or you should be anyway. Um, from there, now I have my school in Sheffield that I'm building up. I'm very thankful for the students that we have there. We have some great students. I have blue belts under me. I'm waiting to see who's going to be my next purple, who's going to be my first purple belt. I have some great hard-working students. And it's good to see those students over here trying to also improve their lives. So, thank you for watching uh, this video. Thank you for watch listening to me. Um, it's been a long journey and any advice I can give to you all is just to continue training, keep training, keep training. If it's just for pleasure, it's a long journey. Don't expect to... Uh, to be a black belt in in five years it takes time the longer it takes the better it is for you to tell you the truth and those that want to be teachers it's a lot of effort but it's very very rewarding and I couldn't think of a better job that I could be doing right now and basically that's down to the Valente brothers helping me get where I've got to so far and hopefully keep pushing me to where I'm going in the future. I need that drive. Um, and also to everyone that's helped me so far, to the support I've had in England, to the support I've had in America in, from most of the students uh, that know me very well, and to family members that have helped me. It's not been an easy journey. You have to sacrifice a lot of things, but in my opinion, when you find what you love, then it's all worth it. And that is something that I feel in the world that is a problem. There's so many people doing jobs that they just don't like doing them. They're doing the job because they need to make a living, not because they love what they do. And some people never do find what they love doing because they're not searching for it. 
luckily I found what I want to do and I had to make sacrifices I don't see all the friends that I like to see every week but to tell you the truth Jiu Jitsu makes it all worth it so my message is to everybody out there if you find something you love do it do whatever it takes because if you do something that you don't like for the rest of your life your children eventually are going to do the same cycle and it's going to continue, it's going to continue, it's going to continue. I'm not saying you should go and quit your job tomorrow. What I'm saying to you is find something that you think is fantastic, that you love doing and slowly, slowly start to focus more and more on that until it starts to make you a living and then you can cut the other one out. It's possible with the support of your friends and your family. Those that don't support you, that are negative, then maybe you need to move away from that side and, and be with the people that are supporting you and um, giving the right directions in life. So take care everybody and we'll speak soon. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Anything you want to ask is perfectly fine. Okay, take care.